For many consecutive years now, and under two different Liberal premiers, the Ontario government has run deficits but promised a balanced budget for the year 2017-18. As zero hour approaches, it looks as if the government will meet its target. But of course, that still leaves the aftermath of years of deficit spending. As of March 2016, Ontario's debt, that's the accumulation of year after year of deficits, that number stood at more than $325 billion. Just paying the interest on that debt is now the third largest expense in the provincial budget. So, what's a province with big plans and big debts to do? Let's ask. Craig Alexander, he's Senior Vice President, Chief Economist at the Conference Board of Canada. Kaylee Thiessen, Economist and Researcher with the Trade Union Unifor. Bill Robson, President, CEO of the C.D. Howe Institute. And Lisa Phillips, Tax Law and Policy Professor at the Osgoode Hall Law School. And it's great to have you four around our table here at TVO tonight. Let us just uh, cast our eyes to the monitors here because we want to actually show what's happened to the net debt of the province of Ontario over the past almost decade. You see back in 2007-8, the bars, we were at $157 billion of debt. And then, of course, the Great Recession hits. And you see what's happened to the debt. We're now almost twice the debt level for the forecasted year of 2020. The red line on top of that, though, shows somewhat of a more encouraging picture in that the debt, net debt to GDP ratio looks like it's coming down ever so slightly. So yes, the debt as a number is bigger, but as a percentage of the economy, it's coming down. So let's figure out what this all means. Uh, okay, Craig, get us started here. How concerned are you at the size of the Ontario debt? Ontario has the fiscal capacity to meet its debt obligations, but the amount of debt that it's taken on is actually creating quite a big burden. And at the same time, it's posing some significant risks for the future. Uh, when you look at debt service costs, because interest rates are so low, only nine cents of every dollar of tax revenue is going to, to, to service the debt, uh, which is, is manageable. But the problem is that when you do it in dollar terms, that's $12 billion that could be going to other social priorities like health and education. So. Even though there isn't a, a fiscal crisis in Ontario, the point is that there's a large cost associated with the enormous debt that Ontario has taken on. So on a scale of zero to 10, zero means you don't care about it at all, 10 means the apocalypse is coming. Where do I put you? I'd be a seven or an eight. You'd be a seven because or an eight. Because at okay. the end of the day, when you do forward-looking projections, the amount of pressure that's going to come on the health care system basically is going to lead to health care expenditures far outstripping the province's fiscal capacity to meet them. And as a result, while we don't have a crisis today, when you, do, when you look forward, economics says that Ontario is on an unsustainable path. So we need to do something about it. Lisa Phillips, uh, when you look at that $350 billion plus debt number, what do you think? You know, it's not keeping me awake at night. Um, I think that all of us who have mortgages could easily freak ourselves out by looking at the dollar amount that we owe. But the reality is that uh, this is paid over a long period of time. We have a plan to pay it down. Hopefully we have rising income. Uh, if we can sustain a, a balanced budget for a period of time, there will be a natural kind of uh, decline in the relationship between the debt and the GDP. So again, on that scale of 0 to 10? I'm more of a 3 or a 4. You're a 3 or a 4. Okay. Kaylee, I'm coming to you next. You look at that number, I, and what do you think? I feel the same. I'm more of a, a 3 or a 4. I think that uh, certainly if you just put that number up with, without any context behind it, it can have some shock value. But in fact, if you look at the larger context, and Craig laid some of that out already, there is not so much to worry about. And in fact, what we should be thinking about is how we're going to uh, raise the revenue to pay for the other things that we're going to need to pay for, including uh, additional health care costs and those sorts of things going into the future. Okay. Bill, your view. I'll put myself near Craig's end of the spectrum. Uh, a couple of points. Uh, I actually am more concerned because the apocalypse isn't coming, which sounds like a funny thing to say, but who's in more trouble? The person who's digging a hole, uh, you know, whose credit card isn't maxed out and is piling on debt for consumption, or the person who's already kind of run into the wall and is, is forced to square revenue and expenditure? In a way, Ontario's deep fiscal capacity is a problem because we don't have that external check on what we're doing. There's, you know, we, we've had some decline in our credit ratings, but nobody's seriously saying the province is running out of room to borrow. And that means that we've got the shovel in our hands and we're able to dig faster than we would otherwise. So one, one quick nuance on that. The, with regard to the numbers, the thing that I would say is that the debt figures that we've been talking about are the ones that also include debt that uh, finance infrastructure spending. 
So some of this stuff, there are actually assets, and that type of debt worries me a bit less. I mean, we can talk about whether every infrastructure investment is wise and whether the government has the right way of approaching that, but in general, I think a lot of us would say, and here's the mortgage analogy, you know, you got a, you got a house to live in, so you've got an asset. A lot of what's in that debt number, though, is just the accumulated deficits. And that's the money that we were basically consuming but didn't feel like we could raise the taxes to cover at the time. So if I'm putting a number on your level of concern, what is it? Yeah, so I would be, I would be in the... I'll, I'll give myself a, an 8 uh, with the anxiety being a little higher that we still are in a position to keep adding to this debt. And I totally agree with what Craig said about the health care costs. That's massive. And just to... Uh, spice up the, the the concern a little bit. I'll also add some pension obligations that we can't see, mm -hmm. but they're out there. And also the municipal uh, requirements that are out there. I mean, when we think about other things we're going to want some tax room for, uh, municipalities have fairly big loads to carry in the future as well. Okay. And the province needs to make room for that. You use the house analogy, and Lisa, let me pick up on that with you. Everybody understands, and you used it as well, the notion of you got to go into debt to buy a house. Mm -hmm. Almost nobody's paying cash to buy their house these days. you got to borrow money to pay to buy for the house. But if you're borrowing or putting the electricity bills on a credit card, mm -hmm. that's a different thing. Mm -hmm. Everybody seems to agree that is not a great idea. That suggests that you're overextended. Can you tell how much of that $350 billion of debt is actually for the house and how much is for the electricity? Uh, we know some of it's for the electricity, but here's where I'd like to just draw attention to the fact that this discussion so often focuses on the spending side, on the expenses. And we know there's also a revenue side of the budget. And if we need to bring current expenditures like the electricity and revenues into balance, I think that erosion of the revenue base in Ontario has been a major cause of why we've had this long stretch of deficits. And I think it will continue to challenge us in the future. So I, I would agree that we need to contend with that, that balance uh, in the next few years. I want to, make, I want to translate. Erosion of revenue base yeah. means taxes are not high enough in your view. Is that uh, right? Yes, it means that we've had a 15-year campaign of tax cuts at the federal level and that those tax policy choices have directly impacted Ontario's revenues. The two, it's very hard to separate the two levels of government on the revenue side. And so, uh, you know, when the federal government cuts taxes for 15 years, GST, personal income tax, corporate tax, lots of new expensive tax expenditures, it reduces their ability to make transfer payments to Ontario to help Ontario balance its budget. Uh, Ontario has also made some tax cuts. Uh, I think there's less room to maneuver there. But I think we've got to talk to our federal partners about a better, better partnership. Is the debt number as high as it is, in your view, Craig, because the, what did you call it, the erosion of the... Revenue base. Revenue base has <laughs> taken place over the last decade? Well, if, if, we, if we look at revenue growth in Ontario over the last 10 years, I mean, it has been a challenging economic environment. The pace of growth in the economy has not been strong. This has meant that, that income growth in the economy has not been uh, robust. And so it has had an impact in terms of constraining the amount of, of tax revenues the government's receiving. I actually personally don't think taxes in Ontario are low. I think personal income taxes are quite high. I think corporate and business taxes are competitive and we need to keep them competitive. Uh, so I don't actually think that you know there's you would consider Ontario to be a low a low tax regime. I think the problem on the revenue side has been how weak the the pace of economic growth has been, and I do think this is a a big risk in terms of the government's current fiscal projections. They're they're assuming um, that income in the economy is going to grow at above four percent you know over the next several years, helping them to bring in revenues. And I think that there's a a material downside risk to that revenue forecast. They're also counting on federal transfers, uh, and, and they will come for the infra on the infrastructure side. But one of the risks going forward, particularly in 2017, 2018, is Ontario might get less in the way of equalization payments from the federal government. So because the transfers, economy will be doing better? Well, because Ontario's doing, doing a little better, and Alberta Alberta's doing a lot worse. Right. Um, the payments to, that are made to try and equalize fiscal capacity um, work with a three-year calculation, and you don't want to get into the details of equalization. The bottom line is that payments that Ontario, the Ontario government is, are, are, is currently receiving are going to drop as, as Ontario's outperformance shows up in terms of three-year average. So let's understand this. I, I, I confess, I mean, we have a lot of smart people who watch this program, Kaylee, which means that they email me and tweet and Facebook message me on some fairly arcane matters from time to time. Okay. This is one of them. I do have people who, who send me messages saying, 
What does $350 billion of debt mean to me and my bottom line as a homeowner, as a citizen of Ontario, et cetera? What's the answer to that? Well, I think we actually need to look at that very differently. A government is not the same as, as a homeowner, and sometimes that analogy works and sometimes it doesn't. In fact, a, the Ontario government can go on into infinity, continuously paying off the debt that we have and borrowing to, to build uh, more infrastructure and pay for other things. Uh, I do agree that we have a revenue problem, but I think there's more to it than what we've heard so far. Uh, first, there, there have been some changes at the federal level, and we need to take those into account. We're thinking about the GST cut and also corporate tax cuts that have taken place. And I think that there is room for Ontario to actually move up a little bit in some of those areas. Uh, so that so we just have so I understand, raising the GST, raising corporate taxes. Something like raising corporate taxes, we could talk about how we make sure incomes for people at the bottom are rising so that as their income rises, a portion of that income goes to uh, the provincial government and the federal government as well. Uh, and to continue to borrow to pay for the things that we need to build and that the future generations will be using long, long, uh, a long time from now. And we're talking about roads, we're talking about bridges, we're talking about hospitals, we're talking about education and all of those pieces. So it's a lot more complicated than just the, the sort of mortgage analogy. Sure. Okay. I I'm going to follow up on that angle in a second, but first I want to put a phrase to you which I hear over and over and over, and I want to know if it's actually true. The fact that everybody says it doesn't necessarily make it true. I hear Ontario is, and here comes the expression, the largest subnational jurisdiction in the world with, uh, with sorry, the l most indebted, the most indebted subnational jurisdiction in the world. In other words, not a country, but like a province, a state, a territory, or whatever. It has the largest debt in the world. Is that right? I wonder if it can be right. Uh, when I look at California and I look at some of the hidden liabilities that are popping up there, they have a pension disaster on their hands. Uh, I, I, I'd, I'd hesitate to endorse the number. Uh, Ontario does have a very large debt uh, by subnational government standards. Uh, in its favor, I would say Canada has a fairly decentralized federation where the subnational governments tend to do a lot more than you would see subnational governments do elsewhere. So it stands to reason there'd be more debt. Infrastructure spending is a good example. Uh, provinces in Canada do a lot of the infrastructure spending. Logically, they're going to have a lot of the debt compared to some other countries where the national government might do more. Nothing wrong with that. On the on the subject of the of, of how much of that three hundred odd billion to worry about, uh, I'll say that about a third of it is related to various types of assets that the government has created. So I'll worry a bit less about that and I'll worry a lot more about the other two thirds that really reflects this kind of ongoing mismatch of revenue and spending. Uh, we can talk, uh, and I'm sure we'll talk a bit more about how much tax capacity there is in Ontario. Unifor, good news on GM just now. Nice that they didn't have to fight higher corporate income tax rates getting that investment here in Ontario, but that's an issue for a lot of people. You want to keep those tax rates uh, to the point where, where talented people want to live in this province and work here, and we do have to watch out for that. Having uh, said that, Lisa, let me go to you on this one. If you look at that chart that we started the program with, showing us more than $300 billion in the red, well, that's a lot of money to pay back. Some people are going to be saying, should we really be embarking on a $160 billion borrowing plan to over the next 12 years in order to build all the infrastructure we're building? Some people think that's a lot of debt, additional debt to take on when we already have so much debt to pay back. Are they right to be concerned about that? I don't think there's very many people concerned about that, actually. I think there's a strong consensus that we've got a big deficit on the infrastructure side and that those investments are actually pretty critical to ensure longer-term prosperity, again, attracting businesses to Ontario, good infrastructure helps with that. Um, that's kind of the virtuous side of the debt picture. Um, you know, one piece we haven't talked about, to my surprise, is the impact of the global financial crisis that started in 2008. Mm -hmm. The IMF has just this June, and even more recently, uh, uh, visited, Christine Lagarde was here in Canada, praising Canada for its stimulus spending program, encouraging the federal government to consider doing more and telling it it has the room to do more if necessary. The other thing that didn't get as much airtime in the media is that the IMF said, please provinces, do not attempt to reduce your deficits too quickly and your debts too quickly, because that would simply offset all the good impact of the stimulus spending that's happening at the federal level. So we're still pulling out of that period and then the oil price shock on top of that. Do you though, Craig, get to a point where you are so in debt 
people won't give you more money, even if it's for good things like subways and buses and bridges and so on? Well, we've seen credit rating agencies downgrade Ontario's uh, credit rating. In the middle of 2015, S&P, uh, Standard & Poor's, downgraded Ontario. Now, it still has a very high credit rating um, because it does have taxing capability, and so the odds of a default are extremely low. But it does send a signal that, that from, a, from a debt credit rating point of view, uh, they do pay very close attention to what is happening to, to debt. And when S&P did their downgrade, they actually cited the future in, uh, infrastructure investment as one of the, the reasons why they were doing the downgrade, because they, they felt it could add to, to the, the, the debt burden in, in, in Ontario. So one of the things you might see in Ontario is you could have balanced budgets, but because of the infrastructure debt financing, you could still have the, the, debt, the, the debt to GDP ratio um, failing to decline as the economy grows. So I think one of the things the government's counting on is balance the books, and then as the economy grows, the, the debt to GDP ratio will gradually decline because you're going to grow your way out of it. Well, the problem is that economic growth in Ontario might not be strong enough to, to, to actually create that, and there, and there is the infrastructure spending. I, I agree. I think there is an infrastructure deficit in Ontario. I think that infrastructure investment um, has one of the highest uh, positive boosts to economic growth that you can get from fiscal, from fiscal measures. Uh, but that doesn't mean we can ignore the amount of debt that Ontario has taken on. Well, let's consider, Kaylee, interest rates for a second. I know when I read Paul Krugman in the New York Times, for example, he says now is the time to borrow like crazy because interest rates are basically nothing. And governments can do, you know, it's not like back in the 19, 19, late 1970s when interest rates were over 20% and that was a very difficult time to do anything. However, interest rates have been very, very low for a very, very long time. What if they went up? It doesn't look like they're going to go up in the near future. We saw uh, the Bank of Canada released just recently that they're going to keep their interest rate where it is right now for at least the next two years. Uh, and in fact, even if interest rates did go up a little bit after two years, they'd still be at historically low levels and we'd still have the same advice about borrowing now to build the infrastructure that we need today and into the future. Uh, just as important would be to talk about how we're going to pay for the health care and for the education and other pieces that we want to, to build the Ontario that we want to have in the future. And that's where we need to talk about things like federal government transfers and a strong health accord. Uh, looking at the uh, hydro rates in Ontario and talking about um, how we actually deal with rising energy prices. Is it something we should talk about keeping hydro public, uh, raising incomes of people at the bottom who are struggling to pay those hydro bills so that they can pay for the cost of, of the services that we rely on? And those are places where, where I think uh, we can have a strong conversation. Bill, do you think low interest rates right now, almost nothing, uh, are giving governments a false sense of confidence about how much money they can borrow? Uh, I do think that it runs the risk of making people think, oh, money is so cheap that we can invest without being as, as, as careful as we usually would be about whether it's a smart investment. Uh, you know, a lot of things can look attractive when money is this cheap that if it were more expensive wouldn't look attractive and maybe the bar is right now getting set artificially low. I want to uh, raise a caution here, and I don't think this is likely in the next couple of years. But if you look south of the border, there are subnational uh, governments and municipalities particularly that actually are going under. One of the things that's driving them under is their pension plans. Low interest rates look fun for a borrower who's thinking about an infrastructure project. For pension plans, they are toxic because those pension plans are counting on very high returns in many cases to pay the benefits they've promised. And in many cases, they've got no, uh, no flexibility, no adjustment, no way out. So that's why Detroit went under. That's why we've had some bankruptcies in California. Europe's in trouble. So the thing that I would flag is not necessarily that we see um, some kind of rise over time because of the Bank of Canada, but because there might be sudden sharper concerns about sovereign debt generally. People are going to be seeing some uh, governments fail to honor their obligations. And that changes the whole way people come at this. Right now, people are desperate for anywhere safe to put their money, and so they're lending it out at nothing or sometimes even negative interest rates. There's very little concern about not getting it back. If we see a few more, state of Illinois, for example, uh, uh, getting into the kind of trouble I, I think they will, at that point, a lot of other jurisdictions are going to come under the microscope, and people won't like what they see. Let's read this quote here. This is from the Montreal Economic Institute. A couple of researchers noted in a recent study the following. Sheldon, let's put this up. Ontario is on the road to becoming the new Quebec in terms of saddling future generations with a massive public debt. 
Ontario's per capita net debt has doubled since 2003, while its program spending as a percentage of gross domestic product has climbed a full three percentage points. Even if Ms. Wynne's government meets its deficit reduction targets, Ontario's net debt per capita is set to rise to almost $23,000 by 2018, surpassing Quebec's $22,340. That alone is a powerful disincentive for businesses to invest because it suggests that tax increases are likely to follow. Let's have some discussion about that. I have heard, Craig, people say deficits today are simply tax increases tomorrow. Is that right? Well, the, co the conference board does a, um, a, a survey of, of business confidence. And when you look at the issues that get flagged by businesses, um, one of the things that gets flagged is taxes. And I look at that and sort of say, well, wait a second. We've seen taxes come down in, in recent years. And Canada's, uh, including Ontario's, co uh, corporate taxes are quite competitive. Why are businesses flagging taxes as a leading concern? And, one of the, and I think it's partly a reflection of concerns about future taxation, that when you see government running large deficits, when you see the debt steadily rising, businesses start to think that ultimately this is going to lead to higher taxes that they're going to have to pay. And when, when, I, when we were looking at, do, uh, up, um, when we were looking at revising our, our national and Ontario economic projections, one of the things that happened in our recent forecast cycle is we had to actually downgrade economic growth nationally and in Ontario in, in 2017, 18, 19, because what we're not seeing is private sector investment. And, and yet, We're when still you... Still sitting on all that dead money. Well, you know, we can get into a very long conversation. I think we did a show entirely yes, on, 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 on dead money. And quite frankly, I think that it's, it's, it's a myth. It's a lack of understanding of how businesses operate their balance sheets. What you can see is businesses have not been investing in new capacity in Ontario. And in fact, in some industries, we can actually see them pushing up against capacity constraints. So in other words, these are, these are industries working at full capacity, and yet they're not willing to invest. And so this is actually hampering economic growth. We don't see investment in private sector capital. The, the, the trend growth rate in the Ontario economy is going to be slower. That has knock-on effects in terms of slowing down in, 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 um, other factors like tax revenue growth. So governments might be overestimating how much tax revenues they're going to be getting simply because the trend rate of growth in the economy is going to be significantly slower. Lisa, do large debts and deficits today equal larger tax increases tomorrow? Unfortunately, there are limited choices. We can uh, increase revenues, we can cut spending, have austerity measures, right? Or we can run up borrowing. That's sort of the way it works. And so uh, while in an ideal world, we would all like to see our taxes keep going down, uh, they probably, probably need to take up a bit of the room that has been relinquished over in recent years. What the lack of private uh, business investment tells me is that the campaign of tax cuts over the last 15 years hasn't really generated the kind of additional private sector activity that they were you know, supposed to do. Um, so I, I don't know why we would continue uh, cutting taxes at the expense of you know, suppressing uh, consumer demand and other kinds of growth inducing. Well, let me look at the flip side of that. I'll do that with you, Kaylee. For all of the indebtedness Ontario as a province and Canada as a country have incurred over the last decade in order to fight the ravages of the Great Recession, can we say that that money truly made a difference? Well, I think what I'd like to do is go back a little bit to what you're saying about uh, government or business investment. And businesses oh, wait a aren't what necessarily... What happened to my question? <laughs> what happened to my question? <laughs> businesses aren't necessarily okay. investing. And I think that part of, part of the reason for that is that there isn't demand for their products because people don't have the money to pay for it. And we've seen uh, cuts cuts to services and austerity. We've seen tax cuts trying to generate business investment, and we've been going at it in the wrong way. In fact, we need to start a campaign for building the Ontario we want. We can talk about a race to the top instead of this race to the bottom that we've all been uh, participating in to start talking about how to grow our economy and build an economy that is uh, focused on equity and equality and strong public services. Isn't the current Ontario government doing that? That's been part of it. We also have seen that tax, or excuse me, pet spending has been squeezed over the last number of years since since uh, we we had an increase in spending just after the recession, and since 2011, we actually have a gouge in the amount of spending that would have taken place had we continued on the same path. So that is a 10 billion dollar gouge. Actually, it's an 8 percent decrease by 2018 uh, in things like spending on healthcare, which we've men mentioned a few times, spending on public transit 
spending on education, all of those pieces. And those are things that Canadians and Ontarians rely on just as much as, as, uh, as the rest of it. You know there are Conservatives listening to what you just said and their heads are exploding at the notion that the Wynne government has somehow constrained spending over the last several <laughs> there years. Has, there has been a very serious constraint on spending Nobody over the last several it. years. Nobody believes we it. Have, by 2018, we will have spent $10 billion less if you look at per capita spending and the growth rate with uh, inflation adjustments. We've spent ten, we will be spending $10 billion less than we did in 2011. Okay. And that's a huge cut to the services that we rely on. And we're investing in our, uh, our older folks, our, our young people, children, so that everyone has the chance to thrive. Okay, you dodged me, but Bill's gonna take up that question <laughs> I asked before, which is for all of that indebtedness that we as a country and as a province incurred to fight the Great Recession, how much of it actually was constructive at the end of the day? I think probably what the federal government did right when the crisis was hitting uh, letting its budget go as far into deficit as it did probably was helpful. Um, usually the things that you look at for figuring out is fiscal policy going to have these effects that people often talk about stimulating the economy. Uh, what matters? Well, first of all, do you have a floating or a fixed exchange rate? Uh, that's actually not something that we debated, uh, but, but typically fiscal stimulus when you've got a floating exchange rate tends to wash out across the borders a lot more because of the way the exchange rate moves. Um, not going to change that. Uh, but the starting position of the government really matters a lot. So if a government that is in really solid fiscal shape says, here's a temporary measure and here's our plan for getting out of it, then usually the psychological effect of that is quite positive. People say, okay, we need it right now and we can see that there's a plan to get out of this. Uh, I would say that was true of the federal government. I would emphatically say that's not been true of the provincial government. I do not think that uh, people uh, uh, take this government as seriously as maybe even it should. I'll put in a quick plug for the quality of the numbers in Ontario. Uh, there there are a lot of criticisms that we can make about, about governments and the way that they run up debts and so on. Ontario's numbers are actually pretty solid. You can punch them up uh, online and, and, they're, and they're quite realistic. Uh, but, but Ontario has shown a kind of lack of concern about this, I think, over time. And on the subject of business confidence, uh, if you're at all exposed to the energy industry in Ontario, if you're in the business of natural gas, if you're in the business of electricity uh, in any sense, and particularly as a consumer, there are plenty of reasons for businesses to say, we have no idea what is going on. Policy switches dramatically from month to month. Uh, and so a lot of people are frozen in place for that reason. You don't want the debt to be an additional concern. I do want to just say one other thing. We've talked about federal transfers a few times. Where does the money for federal transfers come from? The other pocket. It does not come from Mars. It does not come from the moon. It does not come from the United States. It comes mainly from Ontario. It's the biggest province. So any recipe that says the feds should you know, raise more taxes in Ontario in order to give the Ontario government more money, I'm thinking, hang on, why don't we just cut out the middle person there. If Ontario wants to raise taxes, then they should do it themselves. I'm not a big fan, but that's better than the Fed's doing. Let's follow up on the electricity angle that you raised there. And of course, the big news last week during the speech from the throne was this notion that the Ontario government was basically going to forego about a billion dollars in revenue so they could give an HST cut on people's electricity bills to Ontario ratepayers. Uh, my question is, when you're this much in debt and when you are trying after a decade to put your books back into balance, how advised is an 8% HST cut on hydro bills from well, a financial point of view? Well, from a purely financial point of view, it seems a bit odd to be pushing policies that are going to raise electricity prices and then simultaneously promising rebates to basically offset the increase in those prices. So in other words, taking money out of one pocket in order to put it in the other pocket. Um, so it's but, a purely but, political but, move. But, but I think that, well, I think electricity prices have risen enormously. I think it's taking a toll on personal, on a lot of household finances. Um, I would say that, I would also highlight the fact that small businesses, I believe, are also going to benefit from, from the, the, the rebate that Ontario is, is committing to. And rural. Um, but, but understand that electricity prices are, the generation price is enormously high relative to other jurisdictions. It is a competitive disadvantage for Ontario. Uh, if we went back to 2006, um, electricity prices in Ontario were something like 40% below those in New York, and now they're 5% above, right? So when you're thinking about business investment, one of the, the core pieces of infrastructure that you, you need access to is, is energy, and electricity prices in Ontario are enormously high. So, you know, it, it has become a competitive disadvantage for this province. Having said that, um, Lisa, when you are trying to balance the books for the mm -hmm. first time in a decade, and knowing that 
you know, giving a billion dollar tax cut on the eve of trying to present a balanced budget would presumably put some added pressure on the Minister of Finance in Ontario. Fiscally, mm -hmm. does that make sense to do? I would have much preferred to see something more targeted. I can well imagine, and I sympathize, that there are uh, households on the lower income scale of things that are struggling with those electricity bills. I think something more limited could have fixed that problem without doing an across the board cut. But I do want to um, take Bill on about the choice between raising taxes federally and provincially. I think Ontario, you know, is kind of inherently limited to do it on its own because of those competitive concerns that Craig has been emphasizing. Yes, we have, I would agree with Kaylee, we have a little bit of room to move on the corporate tax because other provinces have had, come up, had to come up, right? Alberta's recently come up to 12. Uh, New Brunswick's announced an increase. So I think there is a little bit of room there. But other than that, you know, our top marginal income tax rate for individuals is already quite high, I would agree. And so I think that there's a limited amount we can do provincially without damaging ourselves. The federal government really controls the tax base. Um, it should be getting on with the review of tax expenditures that was promised in the election campaign. That's kind of slid under the radar because there's so much else going on. One more follow-up to Kaylee on the issue of the hydro rebate. What does Unifor think about the fact that if you live in the north part of Toronto in a monster home with, say, 10,000 square feet, You've just got yourself a massive tax cut if you're not paying HST on your electricity bills now, whereas the person with a, an apartment or a bungalow or something downtown uh, got a very, very small rebate. Yeah, you know, when I heard that announcement, I was, I was pretty disappointed. I thought that there could have been other, other pieces that we could have looked at in order to bring prices down. One thing that Unifor has talked about quite a bit over the last year and a half is keeping hydro public. So instead of selling it off to the private sector, actually keeping it as a public asset, and one that then we can control a little bit more. That, we can that ship has sailed, about, That well, ship has sailed. But we could have talked about stopping the, the, the future, the sale of the rest of the shares and keeping those pieces public, because then we're all owners of that. And we're all benefiting uh, from from the from the uh, revenue that's created Except there. Except the power workers and union benefited actually, even more because they got shares from the sale. Well, and right? if we had actually kept it public or would continue to keep the rest of the rest of it public, then we would have that revenue base. We used to get three hundred million dollars a year in revenue from uh, from Ontario Hydro, Hydro One, mm. that went into Ontario's uh, spending plan and into the budget. Okay, let's finish off in our uh, remaining moments here on again, on this $300 billion plus debt number. Bill, help us understand, does that money, which has been borrowed since Confederation to today, does that ever actually get paid back? In the case of the infrastructure-related stuff, the asset-related uh, money, I suppose, in a sense, you could argue that it does. Uh, these are long-lived projects, uh, and one of the reasons that we show them separately on the books as assets instead of treating them as though they were just all, all consumption is because you're keeping an eye on it. They do wear out over time, and there's a budget for replacing them. Uh, I mentioned already, I'll underline it now, there are lots of uh, pension plans and other institutional investors in Canada who would love to have more opportunities for domestic investment. If you're, if you're managing money for a Canadian pensioner, a Canadian asset is a great place to put it, and it's a source of a lot of frustration to many people that so many of our pension funds are investing in the UK and in Australia and all kinds of opportunities abroad and, and not here at home. Hmm. That's a government policy issue. We could, we could improve that. Um, with regard to the consumption spending, uh, I guess, in a sense, what we're, what we're looking at with that 200 odd billion that we just borrowed because we, we wanted to spend and enjoy ourselves but not tax ourselves forward, it, that's wealth that we've, it, it's foregone. If you look at national wealth, when governments run deficits like that, that's, that's houses we could have had, that's infrastructure we could have built, because this isn't the infrastructure spending I'm talking about, it's wealth that's foregone. My, my take on that is, it's gone. The trick is stop digging the hole deeper now because we should be smarter with this much perspective on what kind of government borrowing does add to wealth, like for infrastructure spending, and what doesn't. We ought to be smarter and we ought to balance the budget as the government has committed to do. And then once we're there, we ought to say, good achievement, let's hold on to that. Hmm. Lisa, of course, the government of Ontario, as a subnational jurisdiction, cannot control the money supply, has no influence over interest rates. As a result, will it be more necessarily? more difficult for the province to pay back all of that money that it has borrowed. 
Well, one thing to remember is that not all of the debt needs to be paid back immediately. So if we were to see increases in interest rates, which we can't control, as you say, um, you know, some of our low interest rates that we've locked in with longer term debt, we'd still continue to benefit from those. So I don't think that there's, there's any panic about interest rates rising quickly and hence putting us into crisis. Indeed, if interest rates are rising, it suggests the economy is beginning to grow more again. And so that will hopefully also contribute to the revenue side. Um, so I, I remain very optimistic that over time, Ontario can bring its debt down. I agree it would be great to free up that fiscal room for other things and to allow us to be in a, a solid position when we do have a next recession to be able to do stimulus spending. But I would like to see it done on the revenue side and not on austerity measures on the spending side. Kaylee, this is not a uh, completely facetious question, but let me try this anyway. One, a Canadian Auto Workers Union was one of your founding groups, right? Predecessors, that's it. Uh, back in the 1990s when Bob Ray was Premier, apparently Bob White, who was the head of the union at the time, the auto workers, came to him and said, look, I know the deficit's nuts and the debt is not nuts. Let's just offer all these guys 50 cents on the dollars and start again. Is that an option for today? Offer which guys 50 cents on the dollar? All the people our, we owe money to. debtors? Yes. <laughs> uh, that seems like an idea that I have not ever heard of or considered before. So <laughs> I think that Neither had this, the premier I mean, of the day. <laughs> at this point, our interest rates are very low. They're locked in for 20 years. Some are locked in for as long as 40 years. It's not something that we need to be concerned about at this time. Mm -hmm. uh, what we should be focusing on is the larger picture and looking at, uh, I've said this already today, but building, building the Ontario that we want to live in for our grandparents, for ourselves, and for our children. And that involves a larger conversation about revenue, about what we're borrowing, what we're borrowing for, what we're building, and, and how we ensure that everyone has shared prosperity. And I'd rather see that. Craig, last word to you on this. Uh, again, I want to take you back 20 years. Paul Merton said, come hell or high water, we're going to beat this deficit to the ground. And he did. Uh, we, we don't have to go into all the chapter and verse now of how he did it, but he did it. Do we need that same kind of approach today, that the deficit and the debt are so scary uh, that a kind of uh, austerity that he brought in 20 years ago is what's called for. Uh, I would be reluctant to recommend you know, significant austerity, but, the, but we also can't ignore the fact that Ontario has accumulated a lot of debt. Um, so it isn't a crisis today. Understand, uh, Ontario credit rating is still very good. Credit rating agencies aren't, aren't signaling they're, they're looking to downgrade Ontario. Uh, Ontario's on track to balance the books, but it's still going to have an issue of, that it's accumulated an awful lot of debt over the last 10 years. And the, uh, Ontario has a budget watchdog, the, the Financial Account Accountability Officer, and uh, he has felt flagged the, the debt as a, as a source of concern. And in particular, the lack of guidance in terms of a plan as to how the government is going to reduce that debt burden. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean reducing the, the outright level of debt. It, it could mean reducing the burden in the sense of the size of debt relative to the size of the economy. But are you saying, like, theoretically, we should be running huge surpluses uh, for many, many years to come so we can start to chip away at that debt more quickly? No, what I, I'm actually, what I'm, what I'm arguing is the, the first thing you do when you end up in a lot of debt is stop adding to the debt. You know, you go see a credit counselor and that's the first recommendation you're going to get. And that's where Ontario is today. It's taken on a lot of debt. It can't afford to continue to pile on debt. Uh, and at the end of the day, it, it needs to, to, the first step is to stop, right? And then the second part of the puzzle is how do you reduce the burden over time? And, I, and, and because it's not a crisis, you can do it incrementally. You don't actually have to take a, a, a slash and burn approach. You, you need intelligent policies around how are you going to grow your economy? How are you going to improve the productivity and the competitiveness of the economy? So you increase the GDP uh, profile, you increase growth to, to reduce the debt burden. But simultaneously, you also need to have plans in place to ensure that you're not piling on a lot of additional uh, debt. And where you are borrowing, make sure it's on the things that have value. Make sure it's on things like infrastructure that's actually going to help economic growth and competitiveness down the road. And gotcha. make a little bit of room for that health care spending as we all get older, because we're all going to want it. Gotcha. Uh, thanks to everybody for coming today, in particular to you for flying all the way in from Ottawa for us. Much appreciated, everybody. Thanks Thank so much. You. Thanks. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.